sort of one. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks to all of you who are uh, tuning in online. Uh, for those of you who are online and can't necessarily see the room, uh, we can literally say it's standing room only. And uh, um, I think that shows how uh, how important the topic is and uh, how expert our, our panelists are. Uh, my name is Gordon Gray. I'm the Quake Professor of Gulf and Arabian Peninsula Affairs here at the Elliott School. And just want to welcome uh, welcome all of you to this event. Before um, I introduce the panelists, I want to um, say a few thank yous. Uh, Christian, thanks for setting it up and uh, uh, taking care of the online audience. Uh, we'll have a chance to ask questions uh, online. Um, Sina, thanks to you for uh, putting together such a great, uh, great panel. Appreciate it. And I also want to thank the ExxonMobil uh, Corporation because they um, provide a nice, generous gift to the Middle East Policy Forum, which makes events like this uh, possible. Now, let me um, introduce um, first our moderator and then our, our panelists. Um, Nagar Mortazabi is an award-winning journalist and commentator, editor, and host of the Iran podcast. Uh, she's also a senior fellow at the Center for International Policy here in uh, here in Washington, and she's been covering Iranian and Middle East um, affairs as well as U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East for uh, well over a decade, I think. Uh, and then in alphabetical order, the panelists are um, first my colleague here at uh, the Elliott School, Sina Azodi, uh, who. Um, deserves applause ahead of time, not for his remarks, but for having just completed his dissertation. So congratulations. He, uh, uh, he's always in a good mood, but he's really been in a good mood. <laughs> um, and uh, he teaches uh, courses on uh, Iran and Iranian foreign policy here. And to his left, your uh, right, at least in terms of seating, I'm not making a uh, any He's talking about me. <laughs> is Jonathan Lord, who's a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, uh, where he directs the Middle East Security uh, Program. And before joining uh, CNAS, he was a uh, professional staff member at House, America, uh, House Armed Services Committee, um, where he, he dealt with uh, CENTCOM and, and Middle East issues. And Right here is Barbara Slavin, who's a distinguished fellow at the Stinson Center here in Washington, and also lecturer here at uh, at the Elliott School. Uh, before joining um, the Stinson Center, she founded and directed the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council, and led a bipartisan task force at um, uh, uh, on Iran. And she's the author of. Bitter and a bitter friends, bosom enemies, Iran, the U.S., and the twisted path to confrontation. So, thanks to all of you and Nadar. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gordon, for the introduction. Thanks to the uh, Elliott School, the Center, for hosting us. A timely uh, conversation and with these excellent experts. Um, I'll get right to it. We will discuss for about. 45 minutes among us, and then we'll take questions from the audience and the online community. Um, so let me start with you, Barbara. If you can give us, I know you follow Iranian politics, US, Iran relations, but also you look followed and studied Israeli politics. Can you give us a quick overview of the past few months since October 7th, what happened, that surprise attack um, through the, the sudden border and also how where we stand today the current state of the conflict looking at the various different actors in the region but mainly from an israeli palestinian viewpoint and then we'll talk about iran the axis of res resistance and us further on but give us sort of a quick overview of what happened to where we are yeah thank you very much and thank you again to elliot school to Sina for inviting me um this is uh the war is now we're going into our fifth month uh, pretty soon at the rate uh, things are going now. It doesn't look like we're going to have a ceasefire. 
Um, it's the longest and bloodiest Arab-Israeli war by far. Uh, as you all know, it started with uh, an atrocious attack by Hamas on Israel, uh, which was followed by um, horrific uh, Israeli retaliation um, that has now killed 30,000 people, um, many of them Hamas, but most of them uh, women and children. Gaza is being erased. Uh, hospitals, schools, apartment blocks, government buildings, mosques uh, turned into rubble uh, in the Israeli effort to ferret out and destroy the Hamas fighters that were responsible for the attack, to find the Hamas leadership that ordered the attack. Um, but it, it is... Um, it has been so disproportionate that even uh, Joe Biden, who is calls himself a Zionist very proudly, has called it over the top. Um, it has, however, put the Palestinian cause back on the international agenda uh, in a way that it hasn't been for more than a decade, certainly not, uh, not since uh, maybe the days when Yasser Arafat was uh, a prisoner in his office in the West Bank and uh, Ariel Sharon decided to withdraw uh, Israeli troops from, from Gaza back in 2005. So there have been efforts made to stop the fighting. There was one brief ceasefire when some Israeli hostages were released, uh, but it didn't last. Um, and there have been efforts since then to get a new ceasefire. Um, it looked promising actually a couple of weeks ago, but those hopes uh, have faded. And um, just today at the UN, the US vetoed, I think the third resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, there is another Security Council resolution that the US is working on, which is much weaker, calls for a temporary ceasefire. Uh, efforts to negotiate a release of remaining hostages are, are still going on quietly, but uh, the Israelis say they are going to um, have a ground invasion of Rafah, which is the last remaining place where Palestinians have found any kind of relative refuge from the Israeli attacks. Uh, you have over a million people now concentrated, mostly in tents, uh, on the border with Egypt. And there are some ominous indications. The Egyptians are building sort of a buffer zone on their side of the border indicating that they expect Israel to mount a ground invasion into Rafa and to push those Palestinians across the border into Egypt. Egypt says it doesn't want that, it won't accept that, but at some point there may be no other place for, for these people to go. And uh, it seems that the Israelis do have a plan to basically not just erase Hamas, but to uh, to change the facts on the ground such that uh, Gaza will be either uninhabitable or uh, certainly under uh, under Israeli full occupation uh, again, as it hasn't been since 2005. Um, I know we're going to talk about the regional prospect, uh, regional escalation. Obviously, there have been reverberations throughout the region. Fortunately, we haven't seen a full-scale conflagration, but there have been attacks and counterattacks across the Lebanese border. Uh, the Houthis, who are a thousand miles away from Gaza, have decided that this is their moment in the sun to attack shipping in the Red Sea, uh, and that has led to American counterattacks. There have also been attacks on American forces stationed in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan. Three Americans were killed in an attack on a rather obscure base in Jordan on the border with uh, with Syria and, and Iraq. We have a really interesting piece, by the way, on the Middle East Perspectives website at Stimson that we put up today about what this base was actually doing uh, and what it does, what its function is. Um, there are people who are calling again for a two-state solution. It seems harder than ever to envision, frankly, given what has happened over the last four and a half months. Uh, there are a number of proposals for what to do with Gaza, but I think the, the immediate issue is uh, how do we stop the war 
mm -hmm. uh, before the death toll reaches 50,000. Because not it's not just the 30,000 who have been killed so far, it's those who are uh, sick, who are not getting medical attention because of course all, almost all the hospitals have essentially been, been shut down. Uh, this is a humanitarian catastrophe, the likes of which we haven't seen in the Middle East. Uh, and I mean, all I could compare it with initially was when Hafez al-Assad destroyed the Syrian city of Hama in 1982 and killed 20,000 people in the space of two weeks. We have not seen death tolls like this um, uh, as a result of, of, you know, an isolated conflict since uh, since then, I mean, we could talk about the U.S. war in Iraq uh, and the casualties there, but that was over a very long period of time. So I think the first issue is whether we can find a way to stop the war, get whoever is still alive among the Israeli hostages freed, and then begin to think about how to deal with the humanitarian needs of two million people in Gaza. So maybe I'll stop there. Thanks, Barbara. I, I'll definitely come back to you. I want to talk about a little bit of the domestic scene in Israel and also what could have been done and prospects for diplomacy. But let me get to Sina. Um, Sina, if you can talk about Iran's role as a regional power, Israel's main foe, also sort of the leader of the so-called axis of resistance, which you mentioned, the Houthis, Hezbollah, Hamas itself, uh, Iraqi militia, um, how is Iran viewing this war? We know Iran hasn't exactly directly inserted into the war. It's been trying to prevent direct confrontation with Israel, with the U.S., but nevertheless has been supportive and encouraging of these uh, various forces that I talked about, although they did try to distance themselves from the October 7th attack at the beginning, calling it an independent Palestinian operation and whatnot. So, Talk about how Iran sees this conflict. How are they influencing the various different actors from the Houthis to Hezbollah and essentially what their strategy is moving forward? What role? Uh, the question is, uh, so uh, from the start of the conflict, Iranians said we encourage it as Khamenei put it, we will kiss the foreheads of the people who did it, but it wasn't us. And it's a miscalculation that you know anyone would think that we were involved. We supported them, we uh, uh, we encouraged them, but we will not get involved. And I think there is a serious concern in Tehran that this could lead to a wider confrontation, especially uh, with the United States. Uh, um, I've seen that the Iranians have been quite concerned that um, U.S. might act, which could directly threaten Iranian interests. Uh, now, in terms of Iran's overall strategy, uh, the strategic goal is basically to push the United States out of the region. Uh, Iranian thinking, and Jonathan and I have discussed this before, is any foreign forces in the region are a potential threat to Iran's security. This has nothing to do with the Islamic Republic. It goes back all the way to the Shah, that if foreign forces leave the region, uh, Iran will find uh, its uh, so-called rightful place in the region. That is to say, Iran wants to become the hegemon of the region. Uh, now, any foreign force is a, not only is a threat to Iran, but it's only an impediment to achieving that role. So when you think of it, everything makes sense. Uh, uh, and Iran's overall strategy is to uh, create a lot of headache for the United States or anyone in the region, any global power, so that they decide to pack up and leave. Uh, from Iraq, but that's Iran's overall strategy. From the Persian Gulf, you know, harassing ships in the Persian Gulf, that's Iran's strategy. Just to send a message that you're not welcome here and you should go home. And you can see it from the narrative, from the discourse of the Iranian officials. The problem, though, is uh, creating headaches for the United States have to be enough that convinces the U.S., to leave the region, but not too much that changed the calculation in Washington that the U.S. must stay in the region. And, and I think this is a delicate uh, situation for Iranians, uh, how to convince the U.S. that they should leave. Um, uh, in Iraq, uh, the conflict in Gaza has resulted in more pressure from Baghdad on Washington 
that you should leave, that you're no longer welcome. Um, I think it was a few weeks ago that a, that an um, Iraqi minister had suggested that the, uh, the Americans think that they are the host and we are their guests. But it's actually quite the other way around, that we are their host and they are the guests, suggesting that maybe it's time for the Americans uh, to leave. Uh, so, and Iranians would be extremely happy if the United States left Iraq, uh, left Syria, uh, or withdrew its ships from the Persian Gulf. Uh, there's also another concern that um, a wider conflict in the region uh, could undermine Iran's, or one of the main pillars of Iran's national security strategy, and that is Hezbollah, or it's its proxy forces. But when I say proxy forces, it's mainly Hezbollah, less Houthis, and less Hamas. Hezbollah is, you know, and you know, defining it in terms of the game of chess is the queen uh, or even the king of Iran's proxy forces. If Hezbollah goes, Iran will lose its first line, line of defense against the Israelis. And think of it, Israel has nuclear weapons. Iranians don't have nuclear weapons. And Hezbollah is set, has been set up there to threaten Israel with, uh, let's call it, unacceptable cost on the Israelis. If Hezbollah is undermined, one of the main pillars of Iran national security is undermined, uh, which could have potential ramifications for Iran's national security. So I don't think Iranians are interested in doing something that could undermine Hezbollah's security either. That's why in the past few years, and you've seen it in Israeli media, in Washington Post, that Iranians have asked the, uh, Hezbollah to uh, not to attack uh, uh, Israelis more openly. Um, also, there's another concern, and I recently noticed, and this is my, uh, as we say, scope of research, um, there's a concern that Iran might, after decades of pursuing the nuclear program, might need the bomb at this point. In the past few months, I've seen on Iranian state TV twice, the former heads of AUI and the current head of AUI being asked whether this is the time uh, should if Iran should get the bomb, twice. And uh, the former head of the AUI, um, Salahi, who was also the for former foreign minister, he suggested, and I think it was quite interesting, he said that we, uh, we have all the technology necessary for the bomb, but we don't need it. This is not our policy. But he was kind of hinting that if things change, Iran might have actually decided to go get the bomb. So there's a lot of concern. Uh, but let me go back to uh, the issue of the United States. Um, Iranians tend to talk loud. Uh, they say a lot of things that they don't mean. Uh, but at the end of the day, they understand that a, a direct confrontation with the United States is a suicide. Um, so that's why they they have tried in the past, in 2003, um, 2020, and 2023 and 2024, have tried to avoid a direct confrontation with the United States. There's no question that the U.S. can win any military conflict with Iran. Um, but the question is, as, at what cost? But regardless, Iranians have tried to avoid it. Um, so again, this goes back to you know making sure that the U.S. doesn't feel the need to stay in the region. The best option or the best outcome for the Iranians is there's enough headache uh, for the Americans that they decide, you know what, doesn't worth it. Let's just pack up and leave the region, which would be the best option for Iranians. And I'll stop here because Iran then can have a lot of latitude in terms of its pursuing in, in terms of pursuing its uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and when I say Iranians uh, think that it's a right to become the hegemon of the region, you just have to, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Just think of what the Saudis have said in the past, that Iranians have been trying to restore, restore the Safavid Empire, referring uh, to uh, the Shia Persian Safavid Empire, right? Because, as I said, Iranians think that they have the right to be the hegemon. And I'll stop here. Okay, thanks, Tina. I'll come back to you, I mm -hmm. promise. We'll talk about... <laughs> Iran's domestic politics as the election is also approaching in Iran. But let me get to Jonathan. If you can um, sort of give us an overview of the U.S. policy towards not just the region, but specifically after October 7th, what happened? 
the bear hog approach towards Israel as they went on this mission to destroy Hamas, if that if you think that's even a possible mission, um, and also towards the opposite side, Iran, the axis of resistance, the various different forces we talked about, Houthis, Hezbollah. We know the U.S. also, does, specifically this administration, does not want direct confrontation with Iran. They don't want another big Middle Eastern war, certainly not with, with a country like Iran. But um, we also saw the response, the U.S. response, when that attack on Jordan happened um, with the targets, the multiple targets on militia. So talk about sort of that. U.S. approach and policy and what the strategy of the administration is moving forward. Was that it? <laughs> or not. Okay. Um, Give us the bird's eye view and then I'll come back okay. to you. Um, let me just start by saying it's great to be here among my esteemed colleagues who are tremendous and people whose work I, I, I really admire um, in this institution. Um, which did not accept me as a graduate student. I'll be the first to say that. I was, I'd say I've been thrown out of nicer places, but no, this is the nicest place I've, I've been rejected. So, um, all, all that to say, um, this is a hard topic. The Middle East um, is a menu of hard topics, but this one um, elicits a lot of emotion uh, from a lot of people in a lot of directions. And so if I come off as somewhat dispassionate in my analysis and my comments, it's not because I'm a robot. It's not because I'm not human. It's because I'm trying to navigate the straits and narrows of this in a way uh, we were landed effective policy uh, and best outcomes. Um, so I'll just start with that caveat and say, um, as my heart begins to race, um, I wanna first contextualize October 7th and the US response uh, in October 6th and the US strategy to the Middle East uh, going into that uh, pivotal watershed moment. Um, and I think the best way to do that, if you take a look at the National Defense Strategy, which was written by this administration, you flip to around page 45, you will get to the section on the Middle East. Um, and you'll find some information there that's actually quite instructive. Um, it is the position of this administration that uh, the priority theaters are going to be the Indo-Pacific and Europe. Uh, China is the pacing challenge and Russia is the acute threat. Uh, and if you read the section on the Middle East, uh, one way to read that is there's a downsizing that need happen to be able to prioritize those other regions. Um, but I don't necessarily read it the same way. I think there's a degree here of where the U.S. is seeking to build interoperability between its partners and Central Command um, in ways that may not have been possible before the Abraham Accords when there were normalized relations between Gulf states and Israel. Uh, to bring the best of everyone's capabilities to bear, uh, to confront shared threats uh, in a way that makes sense uh, in the current day and age, whereas the presence uh, and posture of the U.S. military, if you look around the region, really is a vestige of a time when we were there to get Bathists. Um, we have bases throughout the region that have been there um, decades, um, but I don't think anyone is planning a thunder run through Basra, up through the desert uh, to liberate Iraq again. I certainly don't think anyone is planning a thunder run up through Iraq and then taking a hard right turn into Iran anytime soon. No. Uh, right. It just doesn't make sense, especially considering the threats that those bases face, as we have seen uh, very acutely in recent months, right? So rethinking our entire military presence with these partners to give them the capabilities, the interoperability to lay, take the lead in their own defense so we can right-size certain capabilities which really don't make sense to the region anymore. That's where we were going. Um, in the year prior, um, Saudi normalization became a thing. I remember in March of last year when it was broke, Diane Nissenbaum wrote the story in the Wall Street Journal uh, that Israel, the US, uh, and Saudi Arabia were engaged in these talks uh, to normalize. Um, the very same week, uh, it was announced the, the trilateral agreement in Beijing, um, but we can get into Saudi politics, you know, another another time. All that to say is that there's been a consistent effort by this administration to build this regional paradigm. Jake Sullivan wrote this piece in Foreign Affairs, <laughs> and you know he got a lot of crap for it. Um, and maybe I'm a Jake Sullivan apologist, but he was basically talking about the success of the strategy, um, and I don't think he was wrong. If you think of this, and this is a little reductive, as somewhat of a chess game, the U.S. was making moves, and U.S. adversaries then made counter moves. 
And I think it's fair to frame Hamas's action uh, in the context of what the U.S. was trying to do. Not completely, but if you take a look at the regional trend that was underway, um, most publicly beginning with the signing of the Abraham Accords, and if you sort of forensically try to date back the planning that went into Hamas's attack, you can start to see that individuals like Yahya Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, the masterminds behind this, understood what Israel's normalization with these Arab partners would mean for them. And, you know, people have said, you know, well, you know, the great sin is having forgotten the Palestinians. I don't think the intention here was necessarily to forget the Palestinians. And purposely, from Hamas's perspective, any deal that actually incorporated a better outcome for Palestinians could further isolate Hamas as well. Um, I don't think it was necessarily Saudi normalization that came later. I mean, that might have helped speed or uh, crystallize the planning uh, and the will to commit this attack. But it really, I think, began with this trend of normalization, which began in the last administration. Excuse me. Um, so that's October 6th. October 7th happens. On the day of the attack, um, individuals like myself um, were getting news as it was coming out and were deeply, deeply rattled at the fact that 250 people had been killed in Israel. I mean, how catastrophic. This is the worst attack. I think, you know, we're starting to count, in, you know, in Israeli history, immediately making comparisons to the intelligence failures of the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And then, of course, um, we got the full accounting of what had occurred. Um, over 1,200 dead. Uh, 250 hostages taken back, um, accounts of um, public executions, uh, sexual assault, uh, a litany of horrific things, uh, which I'd rather not, you know, get into again. Um, but here, what I started to observe is we might have a bit of a generational problem in how we describe this, because as I look around the room, I don't see a lot of faces that necessarily were either born or cognizant adults around 9-11, the second intifada. No one in this room, and I know, and I mean, I've seen faces who have, but I'm 40 years old. I remember where I was on 9-11. I remember visiting the Middle East and seeing the torn out, destroyed buses that come from suicide terrorism. I have a visceral understanding of, of, of terrorism in a personal capacity. And so when someone like me describes to someone like you, if you were younger, that imagine 9-11 if 50,000 people died instead of 3,000, that may not land in the fact that all of this is kind of a, an abstraction, including 9-11 itself. So I struggle to explain uh, just how traumatic October 7th was uh, on the Israeli society and people. Um, it, you know, again, in abstraction, was the worst attack on Jewry around the world since the Holocaust. Um, the fallout from this, in terms of Israeli society, we've only begun to feel the reverberations. Um, that's the context of, of what Israel is responding to. Um, now, I think 137 days into this war. The U.S. response. Um, the U.S. response can be characterized largely uh, as Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden, in many respects, is the most senior diplomat this country has ever had. The fact that he has never actually served as a foreign service officer. Uh, his time in politics on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, his time as vice president. Uh, he has probably had more senior bilateral engagement with foreign leaders than most Americans, I could imagine, um, in, 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 in their life. Um, when he sits and talks about having stood next to Golda Meir in 1973, he means it, not just, you know, emotionally, but literally. I mean, he, this is lived history for him. Israel's history is lived history. Um, he believes in the state of Israel. Uh, and I know, you know, people can disagree on that, but that's uh, true for him. Uh, the response uh, reflected that. Uh, an attack unlike anything that Israel has ever experienced. Uh, Joe Biden and America came to Israel's aid, um, both rhetorically and indeed. Um, thing one, making sure that Israel had the military means to defend itself and to get Hamas out of its territory uh, and, 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 and to defend Israelis. 
to make sure that in terms of Iron Dome interceptors and other air defense systems, it had what it's need uh, to neutralize the thousands of rockets that were now falling on Israeli civilians. Um, thing two, um, deter a broader regional escalation in war. Um, in the course of days, he steamed in an entire carrier strike group. Uh, shortly after that, he steamed in another. Three, three fighter squadrons, um, the Bataan Amphibious Ready Group carrying the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit, uh, air defense units. Uh, and then finally, the third piece of this was trying to advise the Israelis on how they should move forward, what he would refer to then as the hard questions that he was asking. Um, he sent in individuals like uh, General, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Glynn, who had experience in counterinsurgency in Iraq, to try to help the Israelis understand the totality and the difficulty of what they were about to undertake uh, based off of the mission that they were describing as the objectives being the political military destruction of Hamas in Gaza and returning all of the hostages. Um, they took some advice, they left some advice on the table, and we can talk more about what that looks like and, and, and what that means for Israel's future in this. Um, but that's ultimately what the U.S. objectives have been to do is to support its partner Israel uh, and to try to uh, deter a broader conflict. I think from the perspective is of, of U.S. administration officials, any day that the region is not in total war is a good day. So I think it's very tactical. It's very day to day. Uh, it's why you're not necessarily seeing um, some lofty strategic aims in this. It's someone shoots something and we shoot it down. You know, just keep a lid on it. Um, I will just very quickly sort of take um, some uh, just just a moment to address some of Barbara's comments about um, Israel's effort here and the strategy. Um, I, I personally you know, disagree that Israel is seeking to um, erase Gaza. Um, I think it would probably give too much credit to the Israelis uh, in the sense that they didn't go into this uh, with a fully uh, baked plan. Uh, they were responding to an attack, um, and uh, that's bottom line the truth. Um, I think it's also important to recognize Hamas's culpability in the civilian harm that we're seeing as well. Um, you can sort of see this lack of parallel. When Hamas crossed into Israel, they attacked military installations and then moved on to civilian installations. But notice those weren't the same. Um, if you survey Gaza and its infrastructure, uh, in and around every place you have civilians, you will find Hamas installations. That's not an accident. Uh, there is space in, in Gaza. There's immense amount of agricultural space uh, in the interior. You know, there, there, there are places that Hamas could have chosen to be. Um, but ultimately, being in and among civilians plays to their doctrine, which is that if there's going to be conflict, um, there should be a civilian casualty toll because for their purposes, um, that is something that they weaponize and press uh, to isolate Israel. And in the case of this conflict, uh, it puts pressure on Israel to end the war prematurely. Um, and by prematurely, I meant while Hamas still exists in Gaza, which is their ultimate aim, is to survive. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that Hamas is deeply culpable in the civilian harm we've seen. And this is, of course, you know, something that's very hotly debated. Um, this is, you know, where, where temperatures start to rise, but um, it's absolutely critical to recognize that um, Israel has not declared war on Palestinians. Um, Israel is fighting a very difficult, entrenched, insurgent force, which has put itself behind civilians. Um, and I'll pause there. I talk way too much as it is, and my mouth has gone completely dry. I'll come back to you, I promise. Can I just, yes. yeah, I'm quoting here Yoav Gallant, the uh, Israeli defense minister. We are fighting against human animals, he said. He called for a quote unquote complete siege on Gaza. Um, his comments are not isolated. Uh, you know, whatever the intent, one can argue, and I think the International Court of Justice, which I forgot to mention, is considering charges of genocide against Israel. Um, whatever the intent, the impact has been the destruction of most of the Gaza Strip. So, um, you know, I keep thinking I'm older than you. I remember the Vietnam War when there was a, a, a phrase that was used about how we had to destroy the village to save it. Um, and Israel 
appears to be destroying Gaza to, to try to save itself. Now, we can argue about whether that is going to be the impact, because I think that what Israel has done is not only cruel and inhumane and grotesque, it is also strategically stupid. They have made Hamas more popular, not less. Now Hamas has martyrs and uh, footage of starving children and babies with gunshots, wounds to, to various parts of their bodies to display all around the world. Israel is more isolated than it's ever been internationally, certainly in my lifetime, and I've been alive for most of the time that Israel has, has been there. And the United States is more isolated than it's ever been because it's supporting Israel. It's not just providing $4 billion a year in regular military aid, the supplemental, which is stuck in Congress, would give Israel $14 billion of additional military aid. And if there are strings attached, I haven't seen them. The only thing the U.S. has done is announced uh, sanctions on four Israeli settlers on the West Bank. We haven't talked about the West Bank um, for uh, attacks on Palestinian uh, Palestinian civilians in the West Bank. Many of them fatal. I think some 300 Palestinians have been killed on the West Bank since October 7th. Um, the International Court of Justice is also considering, uh, as we speak, uh, a case which argues that Israel's occupation of the West Bank and Gaza is illegal under international law. And of course, Israel has occupied that territory for 57 years. So understanding the trauma of Israel is very important because if we don't understand how Israelis feel there will be no prospect of ever going beyond this nightmare and finding any kind of solution that'll last more than a year or two. But you also have to acknowledge that what Israel has done is unheard of in terms of its responses. In the past, Israel would go into Gaza and kill 100 here, 20 there. It called it mowing the grass, horrible term. But what they've done now is if they're not just mowing the grass, they've blown up the whole place. So, Mara, I want to talk to you about domestic Israel politics, but let me piggyback on that and then move internally. How do you think, because this is a question that we get, how do you think they should have responded? There's, um, you know, both from an Israeli perspective, but also Israel's biggest supporter, which is the United States. And, you know, the opposite of conflict, which is diplomacy. Do you think that path has been exhausted enough? in this conflict, well, or even before. No, I'm not a military expert, Jonathan's a military expert, but again, I'm old enough to remember when Israel would be very clever about targeting the people who done it harm and would take its time and be prudent. And, you know, two years after, three years after, Yahya Sinwar would be killed somewhere. Uh, we saw actually that the Israelis are still capable of this. They killed a very important Hamas uh, figure in Beirut in a extremely targeted uh, assassination. Um, if Israel had not gone in guns blazing, hadn't dropped 2000 bombs on apartment buildings, the Israelis would have kept the sympathy of the international community instead of squandering. It. Um, so, you know, I would have, I would have stopped and taken a breath uh, before going in the way they, they did. Um, They've also lost a number of, of soldiers in the Gaza operation. I mean, it's a really dangerous place for the Israelis as well. They've lost over 200 soldiers, I think. How many? 500, in addition to the 1,200 who were killed on October 7th. Uh, so it's been a very, and of course their economy is, uh, is in, in trouble. Uh, their bond rating has been devalued and so on. Uh, there've been a lot of ramifications for Israel. We haven't talked about Bibi Netanyahu yet. I mean, yes, exactly. And, and the fact that Bibi um, was the one who thought that allowing Qatar to give tons of money to Hamas while periodically going in and, and bombing this or that for a week, that that was the strategy that one should use in Gaza after Hamas established itself uh, in elections in 2006 that Hamas won. And then in 2007, they took over Gaza kicked out uh, kicked out the Palestinian Authority and Fatah. This was Bibi's strategy to allow millions of dollars to go into uh, into Gaza 
under the illusion that this would somehow pacify people and they would forget that they were living under Israeli siege, essentially, an occupation. Um, Bibi is still there. He put together a small cabinet of, uh, of including uh, more centrist individuals as a security cabinet to make decisions in the war. But there is huge rage in Israel against Bibi for his policy toward Gaza and also the intelligence failure that allowed this to happen in the first place on October 7th. And if there were elections in Israel now, he would be defeated, his party would be defeated, and you would see a different uh, uh, configuration which might be more amenable to diplomacy. Right now, Bibi is, is Dr. No. Uh, refuses a ceasefire, says that Hamas's conditions are delusional, uh, re has refused a Palestinian state as long as I can remember, um, and insists that, that no way will this, this crisis, this war, lead to a Palestinian state of any sort. Israel retains the right. I mean, he went to the UN and showed a map of Israel that went from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, and there was, there was no occupied anything. It was just Israel. That's Bibi. And of course, his partners in this government are religious extremists who, who really want to either want to push all the Palestinians out and have no compunctions about this high death toll. Um, and, and one more thing, Jonathan, I'm sure you've given it more thought than I have, but I, uh, um, David Petraeus and Andrew Robertson recently published, published a book uh, called Conflict, and they've studied the cases of uh, great powers uh, going to war uh, against uh, insurgency groups. And they found out, thank you, uh, that without an alternative political solution, they ended up being defeated at the end of the conflict. So if Israel's strategy is to eliminate Hamas, as they've repeatedly said, uh, the question is, uh, what is that alternative political solution? And um, speaking of Petraeus, he was recently on uh, Farid Zakaria's show, and he said that he does not see uh, an overall strategy um, other than revenge. It's understandable that the trauma of the October 7th would lead to um, a, a, a reaction, uh, just as it did the, uh, the United States in the post 9-11 world. But the real question is, what is the strategy? Revenge and kill is not real a strategy. Um, and I think um, for a successful counter insurgency operation, which Israelis are now fighting, you need a political solution. And I think that um, by uh, the high number of civilian casualties are creating more trouble for Israel in the future the resentment that it creates within the Palestinian community, people who had nothing to do with Hamas actually resented Hamas's approach are now ended up, you know, uh, disgruntled, resentful. Um, and, and in the long term, I think it could be detrimental to any country's security when you have a population that is angry at some of the things you've done in the past. So, okay, yeah. So, in the interest of time, let me move sure. back to Jonathan. If you want to respond to anything that was said, it's turning into a debate. I love it, but I also <laughs> want to get to the other topics. And if you want to add to what you were saying, the Abraham Accords, I think that was sort of the highlight or one of the focuses of this administration's Middle East policy. We know it's been put sort of on ice, especially the Saudi part, which was a big prize for the administration. It was important for the Israelis. Is this conflict impacting that portion of the policy? Is it just momentarily paused? Do you think they're going to go back to that? And also any other responses you want? And then we'll go back. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I I don't know if I'd call it a momentary pause. Um, I, I would say on October 6th, people like me were sitting around thinking about Saudi-Israel normalization and trying to figure out what was the appropriate amount of Palestinian-Israeli solution yeast to throw into the recipe to make the dough rise. Um, and I think where the administration is uh, and where I think there is opportunity, and when we say opportunity, all things relative, right? The stuff is hard, right? The best case scenario, you're looking at a menu of options that range from catastrophic to maybe we do this and uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Um, in that realm, I think 
the script has been flipped in that now uh, this administration is thinking about Saudi normalization through the eye of the needle of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, such that at the end of this, uh, whatever resolution there is, there will almost be uh, a de facto normalization that brings about the signing of the deal, um, along with all of the specific tenets that were being discussed before October 7th. Um, I mean, right now, Brett is on the on his way to Brett McGurk, I'm sorry, the, the senior NSC um, coordinator for the Middle East, um, is on his way to Cairo uh, to work on the hostage negotiation. Uh, but virtually every week, uh, a senior U.S. leader, I think it was Secretary Blinken, just a, you know last week, um, was in the region, is perennially in the region, attempting to bring about um, some degree of consensus among uh, Arab states, particularly Gulf states, about the quote unquote day after. Um, I think all of that is incredibly noble, um, but, and, and you're gonna see areas where I, I, I agree with my, my, my fellow panelists here. I think in some respects, um, the direct diplomacy is great. Um, the public pronouncements um, of the Biden administration, which since he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, I think in November, basically saying this, this conflict must end with a pathway back to two states, uh, and then continually publicly pressing for a two-state solution, I think is actually counterproductive. Um, four out of five Israelis are looking for the first opportunity to throw Netanyahu and this government out a back door. Um, that was true before October as well. Uh, and I would you know, encourage you to, we, we could talk at length about the straights and narrows and details of Israeli politics, um, but that's been true for some time. Uh, before this conflict erupted. Um, I think all of this public talk about a peace deal um, actually is the only thing that blows any sort of political wind into Netanyahu sales. So if you are seeking uh, a solution whereby um, you get to two states for two people, you could probably bank on the fact that Netanyahu is going to position himself uh, as someone who is going to hold Washington at bay to prevent the creation of a quote unquote terrorist Arab state on our border. Um, and if you're speaking to a shocked and traumatized Israeli public, um, he's probably betting that that, that, that buys him to tomorrow. Um, whereas if you just get out of the way and is, let the Israeli public self-correct the market, um, you're probably gonna end up with a government uh, soon after, uh, which is probably more amenable to a host of solutions. Um, that said, um, trying to build this plane in flight while it's also landing, uh, you have Gulf partners who don't want to touch this conflict right now with a 10-foot pole unless they are absolutely assured that this ends with two states for two peoples. So I do think it's important to be directly messaging and working to build consensus. You know, it was put to me by a, an official um, recently that everyone is sort of on their own clock in the region right now. And the Saudis are on their own minute hand, the Israelis are operating on their own time, Hamas is operating on their own time. And a lot of what US diplomacy in the region of the world has been trying to do is to synchronize the clocks. My advice isn't to try to synchronize anything. My advice is to break the clock. Um, there has never been peace made in the region uh, in the modern era that wasn't signed on the back of a US president that didn't come with major US security guarantees for the partners, that didn't fun functionally transform um, the region in some capacity in a bilateral or multilateral way. That's gonna happen here too. Um, it's probably not gonna happen with Bibi. Um, it may not happen with Joe Biden. I mean, I think there's an irony in the fact that the three people who are talking about, or the three key figures for the day after, are a, a president who has an election in November, a prime minister who may be the most unpopular political uh, person in Israel's history, um, and of course, Abu Mazen, who was 89 years old. Um, I'm much more concerned about the day in between. And I think finally people are starting to come around to the fact that unless we collectively find a way to secure um, 2 million displaced Palestinians in Gaza, we don't have to worry about a day after. That's a luxury we're never gonna have to worry about. Uh, because to Barbara's point, and to Sina's point, from where I sit, um, this hasn't been a counterinsurgency operation. I don't believe Israel is looking for revenge. I just believe they've cherry-picked from our experience certain things that play to their 
tactical ability, of which they have a lot, while kind of ignoring some of the strategic lessons, such that, by and large, if you assess there are 30,000 Hamas guys running around Gaza, and if you kill 30,000 Hamas guys, well, then you have solved the problem. But that is not true. <laughs> uh, and that is a point that um, has been roundly shared with the Israeli government, both by, I think, our officials, by those who are not in the government, that, in fact, an effective counterinsurgency strategy must be people-centric. I look at areas like Amawasi on the coast, where there are now hundreds of thousands of people encamped in tents um, who don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from, who might wait a thousand in line for a toilet. And I think, gosh, this looks like our whole IDP camp on steroids. And I can't, if, if you're not familiar, that is a internally displaced persons camp uh, in Northeast Syria, as well as a refugee camp, um, which by and large, in some degree, has kind of become an incubator for the next generation of ISIS because of the conditions. I can't think of a better area for Hamas to breed a new generation of adherents who can both figuratively and literally pick up the guns to engage in resistance um, as Hamas uh, soldiers, militants, and terrorists fall in battle. So I think it's incredibly important that um, those areas be um, stabilized and secured by someone. But here's the challenge, right? Um, who wants to do that? Um, politically, I can tell you, I mean, for, for all of the consternation about Israel's aims in Gaza, by and large, the Israeli public has no desire to go back to Gaza, to reoccupy Gaza, to be in Gaza. You'll have crazies on the right who espouse this stuff, but they are not representative of the body politic of Israel. Um, never were. Um, the Americans? I mean, the idea that you can just provide humanitarian aid um, and have that be the answer is just insufficient. Hamas is going to be there. They're going to be recruiting already in the north, uh, areas where Israelis have cleared territory and but then left. Hamas has begun to reconstitute its presence, not just to stage attacks, but also provide aid and services to 300,000 displaced um, Gazans in the north to sort of rebuild their bona fides as the insurgent force, as the proto-state. Um, it cannot be ignored. So. Israel has a problem here because in some respects, there's a political demand based off of uh, what this is all in response to, remember October 7th, versus the reality of what can be achieved militarily, and then what either politically or militarily the market will bear. Um, who is going to fill the security gap in these areas? Where are you going to put the people? How are you going to provide them services? I don't think you can do that unless you're doing it on the back of Western military logistics, not to a sufficient degree. Um, is that a US-led coalition? Is that something else? Um, but no one's having that honest debate. Um, but I don't see this ending in a way that is favorable to Palestinian outcomes or Israeli security, unless we are serious about what this operation or stabilization operation attendant uh, must actually achieve. And I'll pause there. Okay, let me do one quick round here and then we go to the audience. Now, can you speak to Iran's domestic conversations on this issue and beyond more. We're entering election season. I mean, we are in election season, important elections coming up in Iran for the parliament, the next year followed by the presidency. Um, you already touched up on the discussion on the nuclear program, if you can elaborate on that and how this war, the October 7th, the conflict has or not uh, impacted Iran's regional policy, foreign policy thinking, um, the deal with Saudi Arabia or Iran's outlook is with the entire region? I, I think the elections, uh, so that we have the parliamentarian elections and concurrently we have the elections for the Council of Experts, which on paper is supposed to elect uh, the supreme leader on behalf of the people. That's on paper. I mean, this is not democratic by any means. Nobody uh, questions that. Um, so, but but everything in Iran's domestic politics, and that is now this is about the issue of succession, with the supreme leader being at the age of eighty-five, and he's already sick. Uh, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer years ago, uh, and I've seen him recently. He sounds and he looks a lot more frail compared to I don't know two years ago. Last year there was a rumor that he had even passed away. Um, you know, the usual conspiracy theories in Iran's domestic policy. So everything 
uh, all the elections in Iran are now about the issue of the succession of Khamenei. Now, this, I don't think, changes uh, Iran's overall regional policies. What uh, changes Iran's uh, short-term foreign policy is the uh, presidential elections. Uh, there are two different types of uh, approaches. One, uh, led by you know people like Rouhani, the former president, who think that Iran can and should improve relations with the West. And by the West, meaning the Europeans, because the United States has its own um, issues. Um, but there's also another approach which is represented by this administration, and that is a regional relationship with the Saudis, with Emiratis, Kuwaitis, Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, plus look to the East, meaning China and Russia. Um, in the short term, um, the next presidential elections, which my guess is Raisi will be called, quote unquote, elected again, uh, so that will not change in the short term, but in the long term, we have to see what happens. Now, in terms of the nuclear program, I don't think that in, and I wrote a piece for Barbara recently, that in 2024, Iran will get the bomb or will make the decision to get the bomb because Iran does not need the bomb at this point. It's a uh, so-called uh, asymmetric deterrence works effectively. It does not need one at the moment. But my research shows that a, a, a emergence of an acute security threat, let's say Saudi Arabia, you wake up tomorrow and they have nuclear weapons, uh, or you wake up next day and the Israelis have announced that, okay, well, you know what, we're just gonna abandon our nuclear opacity. Uh, we're gonna announce that we're gonna have the bomb. So that would put uh, an immense amount of pressure on Iranians to uh, test at least and, and come out. But I don't think that they are interested. I don't think they have concluded at this point that they need the bomb. Uh, this can change, obviously, if one of the pillars of the defense strategy that is Houthis, the ballistic missile program, I mean, excuse me, the, the proxy forces, the ballistic missile program, or the nuclear program itself is undermined. Um, and I can elaborate this later if there's a question on it. But or you can I'll read about it on our Or we can read about it. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure there'll be more questions, but let me wrap up with you and then we'll go to the audience, questions from the audience. Um, Barbara, you may not be a military expert, but you're a veteran journalist. So I want to ask you about the war of narratives. This is very much a military war. It's also a war of narratives and disinformation on both sides. Um, and we know that, as you mentioned, this has, the way this has unfolded has impacted not only Israel's image, but the U.S. And, you know, this is a democratic administration. This is a president who exudes empathy or did before. Um, and now he's turned into one of the most, you know, disliked in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, in the global South, the double standard right after the uh, Ukraine war, Russia's attack on Ukraine that's coming from the White House, from, from the administration. Talk about how this has impacted not only Israel's image, but also the United States and the world. Yeah, it's it's been very upsetting, frankly. I mean, um, you know, I like Joe Biden and it, it pains me that there are signs going up that say genocide Joe. And I'm sure they've been on this college campus. They've been on lots of college campuses and not just on college campuses. Um, you know, he he did not show the same amount of empathy and sympathy with Palestinian victims um, that he did with Israelis. You know, especially at the beginning, he disputed the death tolls that were coming out from uh, the Hamas controlled uh, uh, health ministry in Gaza. But those tolls apparently are accurate. They are, you know, there are IDs for all these people who've been killed. And so. Um, you know, it has had an impact and it could cost him the presidential election. You know, if he loses Michigan, where there's a very large uh, Muslim American population, 
uh, people who just may not come out to vote at all. Now, I would argue that Donald Trump is no friend of Muslims, since we all remember his Muslim ban, um, which he put into effect the first week that he came into to office. But um, but it has had a real uh, a, a very damaging effect, and for Israel as well. You know. Um, there is a lot of anti-Israel feeling uh, around the world. There always has been. There's a lot of anti-Semitism, uh, but the the you know the pictures that have come out from Gaza have been so horrific, uh, and you know some of them may be manipulated, but not all for sure. And uh, the accounts of uh, aid workers over over a hundred uh, worker aid UN aid workers have been killed uh, in the conflict. Uh, doctors, journalists, many journalists, some of them apparently deliberately targeted by the Israelis. So, you know, I don't know what the latest polls show in the United States, but we've seen uh, a majority of European countries now call for a, uh, an immediate ceasefire. Uh, it's not just in the global south. I think it's fair to say that the in the the war of the narratives, Israel has been uh, a big loser, and the United States a secondary loser, uh, particularly as this war has dragged on and on and on, uh, and uh, you know, uh, with just mounting mounting death tolls. And it, it pains me as a as a supporter of the state of Israel. You may not believe it, but I am, and as, certainly as a patriotic American, it pains me to see uh, what has happened. Um, I think that the only way we turn this narrative around or begin to turn it around is by getting a ceasefire now uh, and uh, begin to move in with urgently needed humanitarian aid. That's the first step. We can talk about the day after, many days after, but first you have to stop killing people. Thank you. So we already have a question from Corinne Sieber. I hope I'm saying it right. How do you anticipate, and this is to all three of you, whoever wants to jump in, how do you anticipate the outcome of the American presidential election influencing U.S. policy regarding the conflict between Israel and Hamas? I already spoke to that, so. Um, you know, by and large, um, Support for Israel is a is a bipartisan endeavor in this in this country, and um, that by and large has not changed. Uh, I'm not a policy. I'm, I am a policy analyst. I'm not a political analyst. I don't do polling. That's not my thing. Um, so I really can't speak to how um, Arab communities in Michigan will vote or how those uh, you know votes would 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 affect the turnout. Um, I will say this. Um, I have been inside the Beltway long enough to understand that um, most Americans are not pulling a lever either for or against the president because of our Iran policy or whether they're sufficiently supportive for Israel or not. Um, I don't think foreign policy generally moves elections at all. Um, maybe this is the one where that changes, but um, I don't think so. Um, I'll just, you know, I, I, when I talk to particularly my friends in Saudi Arabia, um, they raise this concern about U.S. foreign policy being so partisan that um, they don't know if they're going to be um, embraced one day or torn aside, you know, thrown aside the next. It makes it very hard for them to plan or build relationships with us. Uh, and I'll tell you what I told them is that irrespective of what gets said on the campaign trail, if you take a look at uh, the policy objectives and the actions of administrations that are both Republican and Democrat, uh, you can see a trajectory which is pretty seamless um, to move from the Abraham Accords, um, to move for an attempt to make peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and if you read Barack Reed's book, you can actually see that that was priority number one. And the Abraham Accords were kind of like this happy accident that was, well, we're not going to get that, so let's do this. Um, then to look at the fact that Joe Biden on the campaign trail talked about Saudi Arabia as a, a pariah, make MBS a pariah, uh, and then immediately turned around and began sending senior U.S. officials to Riyadh uh, as president uh, to try to continue to build on this theme of integrating the region uh, with the U.S., each other, and Israel, um, such that I don't see much deviation at all in U.S. policy in the region. I think it's 
fairly bipartisan and sort of continuing along this trend. Um, so where this all ends up, you know, I, I can't say, but by and large, um, when you have Senator Lindsey Graham doing the blocking and tackling in the region for a Biden administration, trying to work with Gulf partners to try to bring them on sides with this president, um, because it'll be easier to get things done with a Democratic president. Um, that's an interesting moment. I think that that, that, that to me represents the fact that um, by and large, there isn't all that much daylight between Republicans and Democrats on the vision for U.S. engagement in the Middle East. Any questions in the room? Yeah. But we alternate. Do you have a lot of questions online? Or? Yeah. Oh, we need two so far. Okay, so let's what? take one from you and then we'll go online. No, no one's on it. Um, so my question is, what role do proxies, can you outline the role that proxies are playing in this? Because my impression before this happened was there were a lot of entities that had no interest in ever seeing the Palestinian Israeli conflict being settled. So what role are proxies playing and how would you outline who's doing what as much as we know at this point? Let me repeat the question louder and again. So the question is the role of the proxies and who is doing what in in the conflict, basically. Do you want to? Um, Maybe uh, they uh, were not. Uh, 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 proxies, I mean, from Tehran's perspective, are their instrument of projecting power. I mean, in the absence of having a modern air force, uh, uh, proxies, ballistic missiles are projecting Iranian power. Um, but they're also designed to threaten, especially in this case, in, in our context, to threaten Israel with uh, uh, the risk of imposing unacceptable costs in case Israel takes an action against Iranians. Like think of Hamas, think of Hezbollah, uh, uh, think of other Shia groups that Iran has set up in uh, Israel's immediate periphery in case Israel takes an action. And think of it again, um, I do nuclear research, for, for me everything goes within that context. Israel has nuclear weapons, Iran does not have nuclear weapons. Um, um, so that's the way Iran can uh, threaten Israel with an unacceptable cost, which we call deterrence. Um, now, who does what? I think, and I, and I pointed out earlier, I think Hezbollah is everything. Um, it's a militia force. It's the only militia, only Arab army that was not defeated by Israelis by not losing the war to Israel in 2006. Uh, all these Arab armies that united and tried to you know, take out Israel, they failed. Hezbollah did not fail by not losing to Israelis. So that uh, and it's also extremely critical for Iranians. Uh, that's why they, they've been repeatedly asking to Hezbollah not to open a second front against Israel because they don't want to lose Hezbollah. Uh, uh, Houthis, less extent, it's, and, and as Iran's ambassador to the UN said, it's not like you know we pick up the phone and tell Houthis to attack. Uh, um, um, it, it, Houthis are more independent of Iran. They have their own agenda. And what they notice is um, that by attacking Israeli ships, they're buying themselves a lot of favorable opinion in the Arab world. Uh, Houthis are the ones are, who are attacking Israel alongside Hamas. Um, so I guess if that answers your question. Can I just add, I mean, we, we do have to point out that, that since 1979, the Islamic Republic of Iran has had uh, an ideological opposition to the state of Israel. And of course, we've all seen and heard the comments about wiping Israel off the map, which go back to Ayatollah Khomeini, the original leader of the revolution. Um, and I think one of the questions has always been whether Israel would, uh, whether Iran would uh, give up its sort of maximalist demands for uh, essentially getting rid of the state of Israel as it now exists and having a referendum among all Palestinians everywhere to set up, I mean, this is a ridiculous idea. One of the things I've noticed over the last couple of months, and it's actually Iranian writers who pointed it out to me, is that Iran has signed off on a bunch mm. of communiques, Arab League, Organization of Islamic Conference, UN, calling for a two-state solution, which is not something Iran has done before. Um, so it's interesting to consider 
uh, you know, there have been periods under Mohammed Hatami in the late 90s when uh, Iran would not be more pro-Palestinian than the Palestinians when it had agreed that anything the Palestinians would accept, mm -hmm. Iran would accept. Um, if there is ever to be some sort of political solution to this that created a Palestinian state, that would take away from Iran and from many of its proxies, it's, it's you know, it's most important uh, argument, it's most important ideological ax to grind. Um, Iran could no longer be more Palestinian than the Palestinians. One other thing in that is most Iranians are not pro-Palestinian. They're more interested in their own lives than they are in spending money on Iraqis and Palestinians and uh, assorted militias around the world. Just uh, one quick sentence, and uh, right. everything goes back to Iran's uh, goal to be the leader of the region. The now, government. they think that by promoting Palestinian rights, they can be the leader of the, you know, uh, or the champion of the Palestinian cause. But the problem is, uh, for, problem for Iranians is that they are Shia Persian, but most of the region is Sunni Arab. So they're not going to accept uh, Shias and Iranians as a champion of Sunni Arabs. That's an insult, I think, to most of the Arabs that accept Iranians as their champion or as their leader. I just think there's a lot of nuance required when thinking about these proxies and to sort of label them all as just different versions of the same thing or that Iran has the ability to sort of flip a switch and a rocket gets fired is just way too reductive. Um, there's an opportunism here, depending on who you're looking at. I mean, in the case of the Iraqis, um, as it has been Iran's goal, it has also been the goal of many of these militia groups to push the U.S. presence and influence out of Iraq. So in that sense, October 7th was really just an opportunity to start shooting at Americans for the purpose of goading the U.S. military into a response militarily in Iraq, which they can turn around and take to the Council of Representatives, do hand wringing, and try to bring yet another political campaign to press the issue of getting the U.S. out of Iraq. Um, Hezbollah is in a very interesting place, whereas, as, as Sina rightly says, Hezbollah represents kind of second strike capacity for, for, for Tehran. So the idea of um, wasting that capability prematurely on Hamas, um, that's not strategically in their interest. It also kind of dovetails ni nicely with something that I've been saying, and whether one is true or untrue, it's it's hard to tell. But um, when when people have asked me like, where is Hassan Nasrallah and all of this, and I say he's done just enough to sort of carry and put forward the bona fides of being part of the resistance without embroiling Hezbollah into a wider war, uh, because he has a stake in Lebanon, uh, he politically, you know, could there could be re repercussions for Hezbollah. Um, that may be true. But I'll also caveat that by saying I might have said the similar thing about Hamas on October 6th, about why they were uh, sort of compliant in their role. It wasn't uh, just that, you know, it wasn't just Netanyahu's paradigm. It sort of it was true until it wasn't. Um, so both of those things can be true. Um, yeah. We Thanks. have two questions, Eileen. I believe. Do you want to read both of them in a row and we have the panel respond? Yeah, sure. So the first one concerns the Houthis. Uh, that is... Um, how will the Houthis attacks on um, shipping in the Red Sea impact the United States, the Israeli war effort, and what is the United States' strategy vis a vis the Houthis? And then the second question concerns the role of Gulf states. While they are part of negotiations, there's a feeling in the Middle East that Gulf states could do more. In your perspective, do Gulf states, uh, could they do more? Um, or what more could they do to accelerate the move towards a political solution? I'll quickly take the first one on, on Houthis. I think if you, I mean, going back to my initial comment, cause headache, cause trouble for the United States. Now, like attacking a ship or here or two is not going to change, you know, the balance of power in the region, but it impacts uh, trade, uh, commerce uh, enough. It increases the cost of, of insurance, you know, shipping rates which causes trouble for the West. And I think that's enough impact for the Houthis. Now, for themselves, like they're saying, we're uh, you know, championing the Palestinian cause. For Iran, it's also the positive thing because they're kind of, again, as I said, they're causing headache for the United States and the West in general to bring it up and say, look, we can cause trouble for you. Houthis can do this to you. Imagine if we wanted to cause you 
trouble. We can do more harm. So I think that's the overall thinking. Can I add something? It's been interesting that the, you know, the U.S. has set up something called Operation Prosperity Guardian uh, to go against the Houthis, and there have been missile strikes uh, against Yemen, U.S., U.K. It's interesting that for all this talk about interoperability and coalitions, the Saudis haven't joined. The only Arab country that agreed to be part of this was Bahrain, where the U.S. Fifth Fleet is located. European countries haven't joined. Um, so it's kind of pointed up once again that the U.S. is, you know, all this. I've, I've been hearing about an Arab NATO and all, you know, Middle East forever and ever. It never really gels. Uh, the Saudis are very worried that the Iranians and the Houthis will come back at them again. And so they're being very careful not to be too closely associated with the United States and Britain in this new campaign uh, against against the Houthis. And I mean, yeah, of course, the Arab states could do more. But, you know, the Saudis, very interestingly, uh, came out and republished, essentially, their 2002 initiative, uh, which calls not just for a two state solution, but for a two state solution based on the 1967 lines with East Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state. That's not something I can imagine not just Bibi, but frankly, any Israeli government necessarily embracing. So the the Saudis have very much pulled back from this notion of, uh, of normalization and are being very cognizant of the fact that their own public opinion, according to a poll done by the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, not exactly an anti-Israel organization, found that 95% of Saudis were uh, were furious about what had happened in in, in Gaza. Um, so it, it'll be a while, I think, before any of these these rosy dreams of U.S. Uh, Arab Israeli you know configurations uh, are ever realized. So, but what is the role of the Gulf states? How much leverage do they have? We know there's a divide between the Arab street. They have money. The they have the money to pay for feeding housing Gazans when when this is all over. Um, I don't think they're going to send troops to last thing they'll do is police the place, uh, but they have money. They have deep pockets. As long as we all still use fossil fuels, they have deep pockets. Um, I'm strangely a little bit more optimistic. Uh, on, on the role of the Gulf um, here. Uh, for one, yeah, I mean, they may not be in this very public operation, which is focused on neutralizing threats coming out of Yemen caused by the Houthis, um, but that's because um, why, would, why would they be? Um, when they can work very quietly with us and not make themselves the target of similar attacks. And we've seen uh, what has happened um, when Gulf states have engaged in ways uh, publicly uh, that the Houthis have not liked. They have made themselves the target. Uh, you can think back to when uh, UAE was supporting uh, the Giants Brigade in Yemen and the fight in the round of Mara uh, is right around the time that the Houthis decided to, to fire missiles uh, at the airport in Abu Dhabi, right? Um, but we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't think there was a lot of interoperability and close communication and uh, military to military work on this threat. Um, below the level of, of, of the public. Um, so that that's all true. Um, look, after 73, um, Sadat made peace um, in Egypt. Uh, I don't think uh, Egyptians then or Egyptians now necessarily broadly have a very high favorability uh, towards Israel. Um, go ask Jordanians. Uh, that peace has been in place and remains in place since 1994. Um, for better or for worse, there's an il inelasticity uh, <laughs> in these governments when it comes to public opinion. It doesn't, it's, it's not non-existent, um, but they seek to do what is in the best interest of uh, their governments and their countries as they see fit. Um, sometimes we say that's courageous. Other times we say it's undemocratic. Uh, I guess it depends on where you fall, but um, I don't necessarily see um, this ending normalization, frankly, because from a real politic perspective, it just makes too much sense for the interests of all of these countries. Um, I see an opportunity to spin uh, the rebuilding of Palestinian communities um, as not charity, but you know, for the right uh, individual or the right psychology. Uh, there's immense capital investment and opportunity here for someone who is thinking along the lines of Vision 2030. If you take a look 
um, at just the capacity among the Palestinian people, which is immense, uh, the geography of having coastline on the Mediterranean, um, a very capable uh, you know, society. Um, there's an immense, and to say nothing of the fact there's offshore gas, which is Palestinian as well, which is ripe for development. Um, it need not be charity like it has been in the past if the U.S. can successfully create a vision uh, that lands the plane. Um, but again, uh, getting past the current conflict is going to be really critical to ever being able to uh, even seriously discuss what that might look like. We have about 10 minutes. I want to take a round of questions from the audience and then come back to the panel. So, yes. Uh, gentlemen in the suit. Yeah. Well, I think you raised the one in the front with the glasses. You raise your hand yeah, first. So, um, Mohammed Reza Musavi here. I'm a journalist from Iran. Uh, my question is about, um, you know, assuming that um, the Israelis reach their uh, goal of the mission impossible, com completely eradicating Hamas from Gaza, which we probably think is not possible. What do you think the, you know, the next force in among the Palestinians will be? I mean, what would it look like? Will it be anything like uh, more peaceful than Hamas or something even more hostile for Israel? Okay, let's take a couple more. The one right behind you. I was wondering uh, how Russia and China were responding to high tensions in the Middle East, and I was also wondering if their goals are similar to Iran's to reduce American influence in the region. And there was one more yes in the back. Right, um, my question is, what? Uh, Can you speak louder, uh, please? What do you see as future tension between Netanyahu, the war cabinet, and Ben Gavir and Smoltrich? Because there seems to be this popular perception that Netanyahu is bad things from each one of Ben Gavir's demands, like reportedly on restricting access to Allah's a mosque during Ramadan. Do you perceive that eventually things will come to a head between them? All great questions, very diverse. Do you each want to take one? I'll take the rest of China. Um, okay. So on uh, the Chinese, uh, and to the Chinese and the Russians are both interested in uh, minimizing, if not uh, kicking out the U.S. from the region, especially Ru uh, Russia nowadays. But for the Russians, I think it's also a predicament, but be because they also want to have their, <clears throat> excuse me, their good relations with the Israelis for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, one being that once the conflict stops the, in, in Gaza, the Israelis could start supporting the Ukrainians, uh, financial, perhaps less, militarily, more. Um, and also the Israelis need the Russians. Um, Iran has uh, what they call advisory uh, personnel in Syria, let's call them military personnel in Syria, and the Israelis have been attacking them quite frequently. And the Russians, uh, if not, uh, maybe not approving their attacks, but they're at least giving them the green light to attack Iranian positions. Uh, maybe in the future, the Russians can tell the Israelis that we're no longer are going to give you green light to attack Iranian positions. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, they both need each other. But I also think, as I said, that both Russia and China are interested in seeing the United States, the United States role in the region, uh, limited and um, ideally out of the region. Can, can I add to that that the, the Chinese in particular and the Russians are enjoying the, the notion of double standards, that the sure. U.S. You know, is all upset ab about all the Ukrainians who've been killed by Russia, but has not shown the same sympathy for the Palestinians. And you know, the Middle East distracts the U.S. from any kind of focus on mm -hmm. on China, Russia, in 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 the way that it could if it if, if it wasn't wasn't going on. Um, let me talk about you know what would come. I mean, it's hard to imagine anything worse than Hamas, uh, frankly. Um, but we have seen an Israeli pattern that um, you know they went into in Lebanon in 1982 to destroy the PLO, and what they got was Hezbollah, which was a much more potent enemy um, than the PLO ever was. Uh, I don't know what will come after Hamas, but but 
for sure there will be uh, all kinds of people who will be inspired to carry out hideous acts of terrorism, not just in Israel, but around the world uh, because of what's happened to, to the Palestinians. This is what, you know, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Al you know, Osama bin Laden referred to the Palestinian cause back when, when Al-Qaeda hit the United States on 9-11. So not only is it impossible to completely destroy Hamas, uh, the way in which this operation has been carried out is likely to inspire more terrorism, more bloodshed. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why I think it was a, a terrible decision on the Israeli part to, to prosecute the war this way. And just a quick note. I mean, if you, from a military standpoint, I mean, destruction of the enemy means not only you diminish their capability, but you also take them the ability to reconstitute their military capability. The question is whether the Israelis can do such a thing to completely eradicate or eliminate Hamas. My answer is no, unless there is a political solution. You right? can't beat something with nothing, basically. Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just go back to, 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 the, to the necessity of a stabilization operation to sort of uh, stem the, the insecurity, uh, number one. Uh, just to address the political question hasn't been touched yet on Israel. Um, I think it's very easy for us in America to think about Netanyahu as like the commander in chief who's making decisions, uh, but that's not really how the Israeli system works. Uh, more broadly in the cabinet, um, it is sort of a camel. Policy is sort of made by committee. Um, and in the case of if you're a minister of something, you have control of that thing. Uh, and that's particularly true in this government uh, by and large because uh, Netanyahu needs Smotrich and Ben Gvir uh, and this government to stick around uh, more than they, practically speaking, need him. Um, in terms of the war cabinet, uh, unfortunately, it's even messier because I have trouble distinguishing at what level what type of decision is made, whether it's made by the chief of defense, Herzl Levy, if it is uh, a committee decision made at the war cabinet or something made in the field. Uh, and if I'm having trouble distinguishing, um, it's quite possible that they're having trouble making decisions. Um, uh, so I, I would say that's that's somewhat problematic. Um, ultimately, this government, you know, if it were not to fall, there's an election in, in 2026. Uh, but I think by and large, uh, it's very difficult to imagine uh, this government not coming to an end sometime uh, in the intervening period. Uh, the demands of the Israeli public are severe. Uh, it's important to recognize very shortly this government exists as sort of a community of strange bedfellows who all had something to get out of it. Uh, well before October 7th, um, you know, Bibi's job in this government, his whole purpose was to try to force transformation in the judicial system so that he could stay out of jail. Um, others came, joined it because they previously were found guilty of corruption crimes and wanted to be in government and therefore needed to make the judicial system also uh, less toothy. Um, religious parties uh, wanted to normalize uh, some more of the religious uh, law into the functioning of the state, something that has been broadly resisted in Israel um, with, with the uh, Supreme Court. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Smotrich and Ben Gvir and their political platforms are well known probably to many in this room. Uh, we're seeking uh, to do similar things to ultimately uh, push through things that by and large would change the character of the state of Israel. Um, all of these things sort of objectively were the same thing in terms of uh, we need to weaken the judici judiciary system, but for all different purposes. So it's kind of a hang together or we all hang apart mentality. That said, if elections were held today, this coalition of 64, uh, a majority coalition in the Knesset of 120 seats would have 40 some seats uh, and Gantz uh, would have a majority coalition of 70 some. So uh, there's no question that um, something is gonna give at some point, but uh, when is the quote unquote appropriate time to move to that? Um, because of this conflict, because of looming conflict potentially with Hezbollah, um, what impact will that have on the decision making of Bibi and others vis-a-vis um, -vis the West Bank and all of that? So it's quite messy, but um, don't for a minute think that Israelis themselves are not screaming at each other in the context of all of this, even within the war, uh, the debate over whether they need to go into Rafah and kill every uh, Hamas individual they can find or to prioritize um, some sort of negotiated solution that brings back the hostages is immensely, immensely 
um, high pitch in Israel right now, involving protests and people lying down in streets and blocking highways. Um, so it's it's a very much an open public raw wound and debate um, in, in in the Israeli political system as well. Well, on that note, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Barbara Slavin, Sina Azadi, and Jonathan Lord. Excellent discussion. I enjoyed the debate, and thanks to all of you for joining us today and the online audience as well. Thank you.